right, Rebecca, uh, we're gonna start off with a friendly introduction, like a, hi, my name is Rebecca, and I'm a super host. Do I look at you or at the camera? What's up, guys? My name is Teddy. I'm Claire, and welcome to another episode of Superhost. We are staying in the most gorgeous home up in the mountains. So quiet here. This Superhost uses the name Betty Lou 52 has a nearly spotless record. It's actually Rebecca. Oh, so you're neither Betty nor Lou. <laughs> What's up, guys? What's up, guys? What's up, guys? You think you come out this far to get away from all those crazy people, but then you get to this house and you realize that the host might be even crazier than those people you left behind. Well, I don't want to get in the way of your trip. Wouldn't want to get a bad review. <laughs> that is the craziest shit I've ever seen. We gotta get more of her. Okay, uh, roll camera. Hi, my name is Rebecca. This is what people want to see. And I am a super host. Complete lunatics. <laughs> this woman, Rebecca, she said that she was the host of this place. But she's not. We have one final surprise for you that I think you're going to love. If anyone's out there watching, please, please help us. Please stop! Think of all the hits you'll get. Look at her. She's harmless. Brandon, Jeff in Vegas, how are you? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining me today. Talk about Superhost. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, great thriller, man. Congratulations. Cool. Thanks, dude. Uh, I, like your, I like your background. Thank you. Yeah. It's kind of <laughs> foreboding, isn't it? A little bit. <laughs> Uh, well, Superhost is about travel vloggers. You know, they're losing subscribers. They have to exaggerate the reviews for views, but sometimes they uh, bit off more than they can chew, huh? Uh, yeah, I think I think that a lot of people agree with Rebecca's actions in this film. <laughs> yeah, because I know I've stayed in Airbnbs before, and I've had hosts say that, "Oh, leave a good review," and they're like, mm -hmm. or or they show up when they're not supposed to. It's like really freaky. So, uh, but Claire and Teddy check into the Sugar House. And you know, Rebecca's deranged. And tell me about finding Rebecca because that actress had to carry this the whole horror of the movie, and she was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, casting casting Rebecca was definitely the biggest challenge of the film, just figuring out who could embody that both sides of the the super elevated, uh, you know, happy host version, and then also the super dark version of her character too. So, um, I, I'd been talking to a couple of different actors, and one actor in particular was um, working on another film in Michigan at the time. And she's like, I'm sorry, I can't make, I can't do this. The script's great. Here's, uh, here's my friend's uh, information, it's Gracie Gillum. And so I looked her up and I was just like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. She's done a bunch of Disney stuff like these teen beach movies. Um, and having someone that has that Disney experience of putting on that face and doing that, you know, that hyper elevated theatrical performance, I thought was really interesting. And, and taking it a step further is the, the press that you do where you're putting on that face for all the Disney interviews and stuff like that. And you're being that perfect person and perfect version of yourself. Um, you know, that was such a cool thing to just sort of tap into because she's experienced that before. And so that was a big part of it. I always felt if Annie from Misery had a younger sister, that would be Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, Claire and Teddy, you know, Teddy is such a mouse. I mean, he was so frustrating through this whole movie. Even, you know, he couldn't defend his girlfriend. He couldn't do anything. And he even admits it. You know, but you think with people in the in the face of their life and death situation, he would rise to the occasion. What a mouse. <laughs> right. Yeah. Osric was always having trouble with that because he's, you know, he's a very fit guy. He works out all the time. He climbs. He does all these things. And so um, I was just like, that's not I mean, you do that. But Teddy, he's he, he works out for glamour. He wants to look good. It doesn't it, there's no functional purpose to any of his muscles. He's just about, you know, uh, it's all aesthetic. So um, that was a big part of it. it was just like Osric, you're 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 you would defend her better than this. I agree, but Teddy, he isn't. He's he's definitely the submissive one of the two. 
Well, I noticed even though there are a couple and Teddy wants to pop the question and make it part of the vlog, I found it interesting. And I don't know if this was a conscious decision on your part. They never kissed once, not a kiss on the cheek, not a kiss on the mouth. They didn't show any kind of affection. Even in bed, I thought they'd roll over and hug or something. But it seems like Teddy was the only one committed in this relationship. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big part of the the story is that Sarah and Claire, she's so focused on this channel and she's so just driven by getting these you know, getting this content out that people might want to watch so that I think that she's turned off that side of her. So when Teddy does do the proposal up on the hill, it just catches her completely by surprise because like, yes, they've been together for so long, but she's created a whole, her whole life is not the life that she's actually living. It's this life that she's projecting onto the screen. So um, yeah, that's there the was real actually, horror. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the real horror, Teddy being rejected. And, you know, how can you go on after that? You know? know, so it's like, good thing there was a distraction. There was a mad super host trying to kill them, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at it too, Osric, I mean, Teddy's character, uh, he he also put the camera out. So it's, it is kind of a, a mixed situation where it's not completely her fault, not completely his fault. He was doing it for the viewers too. He's just a little, not so brash about it. He's a little more subtle and trying to keep it a secret. but. Ultimately, it's a moment that should have been super genuine, but because both of them are confused by the camera, they aren't able to experience it properly. Yeah, usually when someone does a proposal like that and records, it's kind of secretive. But yeah, he just had the camera right then and there. So I guess right. he's not she's not totally to blame either. But uh, tell me about finding that house. I mean, what a great house for this whole setting. Yeah, there was um, there was another house up in the area that uh, was really cool. It was a very modern. It looked like a concrete slab just in the middle of the hill. Um, and I met the owner and I scouted it and everything and, and things were looking good. But then uh, the guy just sort of stopped responding to stuff. And I was just like, oh, man, um, and finding a house that you're able to take over for a full month isn't always the easiest thing. You know, you can go on Airbnb, but a lot of them don't like the idea of you shooting a film there. So I was starting to consider shooting elsewhere, like going up to Canada, where I shot my last two films. And then um, I reached out to a friend of mine, Chloe Cherko, who I knew had a place up in Mount Charleston. And she, uh, she was like, oh yeah, I'm here right now. Why don't you come up and see it? And so I just jumped in my car and drove up and I was like, holy crap, this is, this is the movie. It's such a cinematic house with those big windows and everything like that. So I was just, you know, I sat down with their family who I've known since I moved to Vegas and, uh, they were just like, oh, yeah, for sure. Let's do it. And just super casual about it. <laughs> I was going to say, I saw that in the credits. Thanks to Las Vegas crew. And I'm like, what? This Because yeah, I, I felt, I go, that looked like Mount Charleston. I know every forest looks ripe, you know, the same. Mm -hmm. But I thought, wow, that's Mount Charleston. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. I think an important lesson about your movie is no landline, you know. <laughs> I, <That> is. <laughs> especially in a, in a place like that, you know, most people would have a phone, right? But it's amazing how many people don't have landlines anymore. Yeah, I don't have one. Yeah, exactly. So if you're in a situation <laughs> where you, you have to make a call or there's no reception, you know? Yeah, and uh, I have kids too, so they don't even know what a landline is, I don't think. <laughs> and I think as you know, as you as a writer, director, producer, you know, this is your baby, um, that you have a small cast and a small location, that's really a benefit for the production, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it also comes down to budget. Like we knew that to do a film in the pandemic and to do all the, we, we knew there was gonna be a ton of hoops to jump through, so we couldn't really expand the scope. And so it is really about keeping everything, the narrative tight and just the cast small and just keeping everything so just manageable, you know, so we could actually shoot it during the pandemic. And, um, you know, it's always fun you, when you're writing, you're kind of it's always limitless. And so you have to kind of stop and stop yourself and just say, oh, wait, I need to shrink this down. I need to make it in these locations that we've already established because you can always, you know, you can write whatever. But when you're actually thinking about achieving it and, you know, with limited resources, you, you definitely just need to kind of refocus the script to be manageable. Well, it's all about the performances and the story. And that's what you, you did mm -hmm. a great job with that. And I love what you did. And I noticed it, the door window outline when Rebecca's looking through and you kind of, <laughs> you know, like, oh, that's pretty cool. So I, that kind of worked with that design for the house. Right. Yeah, that was and the script, it, it was a it was a solid door and it had like a people. So Sarah was looking through the people and you had that kind of distorted version of Rebecca looking through. But when we got to the house, I was just like, oh, crap, there's these windows. Uh, we can't do that. So I had to rewrite the scene. So you could, you know, it was, it was supposed to be like, oh, you can't see where she is. Teddy's totally in the dark because she's the only one looking through. And um, yeah, you just sort of take what's there because we couldn't replace the doors or anything. We didn't have money for that. So we just sort of adapted it. And I can't remember, but our first assistant camera, Taylor Miller, he, we were shooting one scene and it was, he was just like, look at her where she is on the window. And it was just like, oh, okay. 
and we just sort of shifted her over a little bit to get her eyes right there. So it worked out well. I thought it was uh, amusing that, you know, you couldn't break windows, you couldn't break any of the house, you know, because yeah. you know, it's a beautiful house. I'm like, <laughs> why, why doesn't, you know, like Rebecca smash a window or something? But I'm like, oh, wait a minute, that would you know, add well, there, Yeah, there is the window crack earlier when when Vera shows up and throws it. And when I showed the script to the, the homeowners, I was just like, there's, you know, it's going to be VFX. It's not real. It's not real. And so, yeah, it was definitely a situation where you can't you can't mess up the house too bad. Well, Brennan, what an excellent film, you know, congratulations, and I wish you all the best of luck, and usually tell people to come visit us in Las Vegas, but you're already here, so. <laughs> I am, yeah. All right, well, thanks so much for joining me today, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Cool, thanks, man.